name is Steve Illis and this is one of a continuing series of videos on methodology in sociology. In this video we're going to focus on measurement and how it relates to internal validity. Measurement is involved anytime you go out and make observations and try to categorize what you see, quantify what you see. In essence, measurement is all about how we generate, create data going from raw observations to data that we use to describe social reality, to test our theories about how social reality works. All of our empirical research is based on data, and data itself is generated through some kind of measurement procedure or process. That data doesn't just, well, pop out of someone's head. It ultimately is a part of something we do to observe the world and create data. And depending on what procedures and processes we use to generate data, we will get different results. And frankly, our research will only be as good as our measurement. Bad measurement will undercut our ability to rigorously test theories, to even describe reality as it really is. The worse our measurement is, the worse our science is. Now this may seem like a very uh, abstract topic, but be comfortable with it. Frankly, you've been doing measurement your whole life. You take your weight on a set of scales, that's measurement. You measure a line with a ruler, that's measurement. You bake a cake and you measure out flour, well, not surprisingly, that's measurement too. If you've ever done uh, a lab experiments, maybe in a chemistry class or a physics class, well, that's a classic example of more rigorous measurement procedures and processes used in the physical or biological sciences. Well, guess what? The same issues come up in social sciences as well. Now, to be able to fully appreciate some of the uh, basic arguments and ideas behind how to do measurement, how to do it properly, and to better understand how measurement can break down and go wrong, let's kind of talk about a couple related issues. Measurement validity and reliability. We want our data to be valid. That's just a fancy way of saying that we want our uh, variables, our measurements I should say, to actually measure what they're supposed to measure. For example, we want an IQ test to really measure something called intelligence. Now, that correspondence between our data, our measurements, and what we're really trying to measure always comes with a little bit of a question mark. The more accurate, the more realistic, the more valid our measurement, the better. But it's always a continuing issue or problem about how strong that correlation is. And of course, if we're not really measuring what we intend to measure, what we think we're measuring, that's going to create a lot of confusion and a lot of problems for us. Reliability is a little different. Reliability is about whether our measurement processes and procedures produce consistent results, reliable results. For example, go back to IQ tests. If you were to take the same IQ test, or at least a similar IQ test, repeatedly over a course of time, Presumably your IQ, your natural uh, capacity to think abstractly and so forth, doesn't just change willy-nilly, day-to-day, minute-to-minute. There's some underlying stable characteristic that we're measuring. If that's true, when we measure it, we should get more or less similar results time after time after time. We should get reliable results. On the other hand, if your IQ appears to jump up and jump down dramatically time after time, there's huge variation in IQ test scores when we do repeated measures, that suggests that the IQ tests are unreliable. And if they're unreliable, well, we have to begin to ask whether they're really valid. The rule of thumb is simple. Unreliable measurements are probably not valid. On the other hand, just because measurements are reliable doesn't always necessarily imply that they're valid. You could have a test, a procedure, a measurement process that produces more or less the same results under the same circumstances, measuring more or less the same thing with the same people. But it wasn't really measuring what it was supposed to measure. I'll give you an example that's a little silly, but imagine using a thermometer to measure a person's IQ. It might, the thermometer might very well be measuring whatever it's measuring, your temperature, pretty reliably. 98.6, 98.7, 98.4, 98.6, time after time after time, over the course of the day, you might very well get similar measurements. The thermometer appears to be giving reliable results, but it's not measuring your IQ. 
So don't always assume that just because your measurement procedures are producing uh, consistent results, they appear reliable, don't jump to the conclusion that it's really measuring what it's supposed to be measuring or what you think it's measuring. The larger point is we want our measurements to be valid and frankly we want them to be reliable. There's a logical connection between reliability and validity. Generally reliability is a precondition for validity. On the other hand, it doesn't guarantee validity. Next, measurement error and bias. When we measure things, a lot of times there's white noise, there's randomness, there's error built into our measurements. Metaphorically, think about going out on a, a target range and shooting at a target. Even a really good shot is going to miss dead center some of the time. If that person continues to shoot at the target, a cluster of bullets will begin to emerge around the center of the target. Many of the shots will be very, very close to the center. A few will be dead on. On the other hand, there will be a few shots that are way off, way to the left, to the right, up, down, and so forth. A cloud of points will emerge around the center and kind of slowly spread out. That's error, or at least metaphorically, that's what error might look like. In essence, you make small little random mistakes when you're doing measurement for all sorts of reasons. Measurements ultimately are, well, they're fallible things. And that's true in all sciences. I don't care if you're talking about physics or you're talking about psychology or you're talking about sociology. If you're asking people questions on surveys or you're simply asking people how tall they are or you're measuring them with uh, some kind of uh, tape measure, even those very rudimentary, simple forms of measurement often will produce certain kinds of error. Now, generally, you want as little error as possible exactly because you want valid measurements. You want accurate measurements. But realistically, almost any measurement procedure you use is going to produce some error, and frankly, a lot of them are going to produce a lot of random error. There is good news about measurement error, even though it is a problem. Measurement error lends itself to some simple tricks. If you've ever taken a, a, a survey, or an IQ test for that matter, you may have noticed that you're being asked similar questions over and over and over again. Why? Well, what they're really doing is doing multiple measurements of more or less the same thing, and then they're averaging the results. It's like going back to the target range and averaging your shots. On average, your shots are clustering around dead, uh, dead center. So if you take a bunch of shots, average them, they, they're usually really, really close to dead center. Using multiple measures and somehow combining them or averaging them allows us to kind of clean up the data and to reduce the amount of error. That's a very powerful trick and there are other tricks as well. Now notice that measurement error is different than what we call measurement bias. Measurement error is, well, it's random. Measurement bias has a direction. We're systematically overcounting or undercounting something, overestimating or underestimating it. Our measurement uh, uh, problems or errors are non-random. Again, let's return to our hypothetical uh, shooting range. Actually, this is something that happened to me. I go out on the shooting range, I shoot with a pistol. I'm not a great shot with a pistol. I tend to pull up and to the right. There's a variety of mistakes I'm making in the way I handle a gun, but it doesn't matter. I tend to pull up and to the right. So if you look at where my shots cluster, they don't tend to cluster right around the middle. They cluster up and to the right. If you try to average out my shots, you're going to get a point that's way off center. The point is, is that with measurement error, some of the tricks or little uh, procedures that we use to deal with measurement error aren't going to work well. Usually measurement bias is a more serious and trickier problem. Measurement bias can occur for a wide variety of reasons. Frankly, uh, it may be the subjects themselves. They may be lying to you. They may misread questions. They may not always be, or they may not always remember things that you're asking them. For a wide variety of different reasons, if you're eliciting observation, eliciting information from subjects, they either purposely or unintentionally give you inaccurate information. That can produce systematic errors, biased measurements. On the other hand, sometimes the very way that you go out and observe things and measure things, your own measurement procedures, 
can be can introduce serious measurement bias. Uh, if you have a set of scales, for example, that are uh, uh, broken and miscalibrated, maybe systematically you're overweighing people. People uh, are uh, time after time being told they're a little heavier than they really are. If that's the case, there's something wrong with the measurement technique or procedure. There's something wrong with the measurement instrument. More generally, the way that you go out and do your measurements can introduce measurement bias, and it can do so in sometimes very subtle, uh, indirect ways. It's a tricky problem. Now, uh, as we begin to wind down on measurement, I'd like to uh, uh, talk just a moment about how measurement relates to internal validity. Internal validity has to do with doing research in a rigorous, accurate, truthful way. We want our research to be logical. We want our research to produce valid results. Now, there's a lot more to internal validity than just measurement. But measurement is a critical issue in establishing good internal validity. When we test our theories, we really want to have a, a good, rigorous test. We want to be able to see whether one variable causes another. We want to be able to distinguish between theories that predict well and theories that don't predict well. When we uh, gather data and calculate correlations, we want those correlations to actually be based on data that's measuring real things. And we want to have that research where we can easily interpret what all those results mean. We can easily tell whether the theory is true and false and so forth. When we go out in the real world and simply try to count people or quantify some kind of social phenomena, we want that research to accurately reflect the real world. All of that are issues that are dealing with internal validity. Of course, again, there's more to internal validity than just measurement, but I want to emphasize as we begin to wind down that without solid, valid, reliable measurement, the entire scientific process begins to break down. And our, we basically have research that fails miserably in terms of internal validity. We can no longer really tell or be confident in whether our research actually accurately uh, falsifies or tests our theories. We find it difficult to interpret our data or to interpret our results. We can no longer be confident that we're really talking about the real world or talking about how things change or how many people are doing one thing or another. Our ability to do any and all those things are only as good as our measurement. So that's the reason we talked about measurement. Now, next time around, we're going to talk about another topic related to internal validity, which is a little trickier in some respects, something called research design. But we'll get to that next time. Thank you very much.